Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you on this holiday weekend. We are happy to have you here today. And we thank Jane for that patriotic medley. And we thank all of you who have or are currently serving um, in the military forces. We so appreciate your dedication to protecting and supporting our country. So thank you. Believe it or not, I have no announcements for today. <laughs> that seems kind of strange after a very busy month of May. Does anyone else in the congregation have an announcement they would like to make? Well, I guess I shouldn't say I have no announcements. I just have a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for the warm welcome you gave me as your, as your pastor last weekend. Um, to be honest, the whole weekend experience of being ordained and um, installed here was just overwhelming to me. And um, I so appreciate your, your words, your gifts, your, your gestures, the wonderful reception that you threw last weekend. Um, Food was astounding, and um, we're still eating some of that chicken salad. <laughs> but, um, wow, I don't think I've ever tasted better chicken salad than that. But I am so excited about to see where we will be going in the future together. And I'm excited to see you all today. I kind of expected that on a holiday weekend, and the day of the Indy 500, that we might have a pretty sparse crowd, but I'm so glad to, to see you all here today. Um, my husband and I uh, had a tradition for many, many years of going to Indianapolis to see the 500. Um, remember, he comes from a car dealer family, <laughs> so they always had great tickets. Like, right in back of the pits. So, um, you know, we could almost call who was gonna win or lose the race based on what we were seeing happening there. So, um, an exciting day, but hey, I'm just really excited to be here today with you all. So, no other announcements? Okay, then I think we will begin. Uh, we'll ask you to stand as you are able for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have left, what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us 
so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Gracious Spirit, hear our pleading. Come, Holy Spirit, come. It's your leading that we're needing. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Guide our thinking and our speaking. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Motivate all in their seeking. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Keep us fervent in our witness. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Ever grant us zealous fitness. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And now we join in our gathering hymn number 412 in your Evangelical Lutheran worship. We will sing the whole hymn. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are the triune God, author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom. Guide us to all truth by your spirit, that we may proclaim all that Christ has revealed and rejoice in the glory he shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading on this Holy Trinity is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6 beginning with the first verse. In the year of Ken Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you read with me a Psalm 29 found in your bulletin insert? Ascribe to the Lord, you gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe, ascribe to, to the Lord the glory to God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. 
The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord all are crying, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. O Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning with the 12th verse. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to living according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We're going to read the Holy Gospel in just a few minutes. But first, um, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Fritz and Terry Brown maybe to come up. I had planned a children's sermon for today, but um, for all we have. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyhow because we're all children of God, right? So. Um, Terry and Chris are going to give me an assist here um, and bring out something that um, I bought for our congregation um, as a bit of a thank you here. And if you want to set it up there where people can see it, see it that would be great. Okay, I know somebody here knows what this is, right? Yell it out. Fire pit. Fire pit. Okay. Um, I got the idea that Emmanuel needed a fire pit last Christmas Eve when we were all out on the lawn. Freezing our butts off. Had, yes, Kathy, you're right, freezing our butts off. And um, I thought, you know, what we need here is just a little fire to warm us up a little bit, someplace where we can go and warm our hands and maybe our feet. And then I, got, I started to think about how a fire pit like this could be a tool for ministry in our community. And I would have asked the children, but I'm going to ask this of you. How might this fire pit be a tool for our ministry to the community that surrounds us? Any ideas? I heard a couple. Val? Fire, everybody shows up and then you talk. You know, I think that's absolutely right. When you see a fire, a bonfire, or even a, you know, a campfire, people tend to gather around that fire. It seems to pull people together. And was it Alita or someone else had an idea too? Sheila. Yeah. How many of you have had the experience of maybe going to camp and um, telling stories around the campfire, uh, maybe singing around the campfire, those songs that you probably never would have been caught dead singing if you were at home, but because you're around a campfire and maybe it's dark and you're with like-minded people, um, you have that freedom to sing as maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, tell ghost stories, but also, you know, to talk, to tell your story, to tell God's story around a fire pit like this. Any other thoughts about that? Well, my thought about this, um, let, me, let me give you an assist here a little bit. Um, I also bought some tongs. Um, 
with handy little rubber tips so that we don't poke eyes out. Um, and I bought some um, giant marshmallows, but today I forgot two things. What did I forget? Yeah, the chocolate and the graham crackers um, for making s'mores. Uh, is there anybody here who has not had the experience of making s'mores over a campfire, little fire? Looks like that's kind of a use universal experience. And um, I was thinking, I think particularly of confirmation that this might be a nice tool to draw together our confirmation students, but I think it could draw together so many people around, our, uh, around the warmth of our Emmanuel community. So maybe what we'll do, I'll talk to the council about this, but I will um, maybe suggest that we bring out the fire pit at some point, um, invite our neighbors around to come over to roast hot dogs or make s'mores or whatever, whatever else we can concoct. And just use it as a way to bring our neighbors together so that we can get to know them and they can get to know us in kind of a you know, non-threatening environment that, you know, we aren't asking for a great commitment of their time. We're just bringing people together. And I, I'll be interested to see, number one, if we can pull it off. I think we can. Um, not too much simpler than that, but we will need, we'll need some charcoal, right? We'll need probably some lighter fluid, and we'll need some very safety-minded people to keep all of us safe around the fire pit. <coughs> I think, yes, it does, it does have kind of a mesh lid. So um, thank you, Chris, for putting that together for us this week. And um, we'll put it someplace safe um, where we can find it when we need it. And let's see if we can have a little fun with that fire pit this summer. Sound good? Yeah. OK. Now. Now I will invite you to stand again for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, you speak, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one 
has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, dear sisters and brothers in Christ, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior. It started about 10 years ago, and it shook me to the core. One of my Minnesota cousins called to tell me that her mother, my beloved Aunt Clarina, had been hospitalized for delusional thinking and paranoia. There seemed to be nothing physically wrong with her that they could find, but her mind was going to very dark places. My aunt was close to 90 then, and her condition was diagnosed as dementia, which is a tricky disease to treat. What scared me the most was that she had stopped going to church. Now this was the woman who held me at the baptismal font as my baptismal sponsor. Her strong faith had been a shining example to me and to her whole large family over the decades. There was nothing, I believed, that would ever shake her faith or cause her to question God's love for her or her love for God. And yet, dementia was slowly taking over her mind and her life. She moved off the farm and into an assisted living complex where her daughter, my cousin, worked. She was treated with medication and with all the loving care that her four children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren could provide. She took up watercolor painting. She played cards and bingo and socialized with other residents at mealtimes. I wrote and called and visited her as much as I possibly could given the 400-mile distance. More than anything, I prayed that God might restore her mental health so that she could find joy in her Christian faith again. I reminded her that my strong faith and that of many other family members was inspired by her unshakable faith in God. Yet nothing seemed to help for quite a while. She would not attend church because she was convinced that she was not worthy of God's love and grace. Perhaps you too have known friends or family members who think they are not worthy of God's love. And perhaps at times you may have felt that way yourself. There might be something in a person's past for which they carry around the weight of guilt and shame, believing that they are not worthy of God's forgiveness and love because of perhaps something they've done or maybe because something has been done to them or maybe because someone in their life has convinced them that they are worthless.
and even among people who have pretty good self-confidence and self-esteem. I believe that quite a few of us harbor a belief that despite what scripture and our pastor tell us, we still have some part that we must play in earning God's favor and love. Isn't this the dilemma that Martin Luther grappled with more than 500 years ago as he sought to earn his own salvation by trying to live a perfect life? He could never measure up to what he thought God expected, and therefore he felt damned for all eternity until he found Paul's letter to the Romans, from which our second lesson today is taken, and discovered that there was nothing he could do to earn God's favor or love. He simply had to accept the gift. We get a feel for this in our first lesson for today, the call of the prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter of the Old Testament book named for him. If you look back at that first lesson, you'll recall that Isaiah had a vision, a revelation, a theophany would be the would be the heavy word for that. He had this vision that God was calling him to speak God's word to the people of Israel. The vision was pretty overwhelming. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a high and lofty throne in the inner sanctum of the Jerusalem temple that was formed by the outspread wings of two giant cherubim or seraphs, which I would just call super angels. Isaiah, I imagine, was slightly intimidated and overwhelmed by this immense God who sat on a 15-foot high throne and whose robes didn't even completely fit into the Jerusalem temple. Isaiah had to be wondering how he would fulfill God's expectations that he move the Israelites into changing their evil ways and returning to God. Now, I'm pretty sure that Isaiah didn't feel worthy to take up this task, but he didn't outright refuse either. In fact, what does he say but Woe is me, I am lost. And Isaiah had reason to fear, for it was life-threatening for uh, sinful mortals to see God. And what happened next seems pretty odd to us as human beings. One of the seraphs or angels flew to Isaiah with a pair of thongs, tongs, excuse me, perhaps like these, holding a burning, glowing piece of coal, perhaps like the charcoal that we will use in our fire pit. The seraph actually touched the coal to Isaiah's lips and told him that now that his lips had been burned and purified with the burning coal, his guilt and sin had been blotted out. That sounds like a really, really painful way to me to be purified. And, you know, I've since learned that um, charcoal, that coal is a purifying agent when burned at the appropriate temple. And I've now seen it in cosmetic products and and other um, items that are intended to purify. And then God said, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Isaiah responded, Here I am, send me. 
Although Isaiah knew how hard his task would be, he accepted God's commission to prophesy and speak God's word. And these were often really tough words. In earlier chapters, Isaiah had written about the many problems of the Judeans. They had forsaken and forgotten God. They had corrupt leadership. Their greed had turned to injustice. On top of all that, their longtime stable king, Isaiah, had died, and they were in the midst of a political crisis. And we know something about that. No wonder Isaiah initially resisted God's call. He, it seemed, was destined to go down in flames. Isaiah's experience reminds me a little of how most pastors initially resist their call to ministry. We do almost everything we can to duck the call until there are no more excuses. It's not the right time. I'm not the right person. I don't have the gifts for this. And of course, I'm not worthy to be a pastor of the church. I'm not a perfect person. I'm sinful. How can I be an example to anyone? Friends, if God called only perfect persons to be pastors, there would be a grand total of zero of us. For me, the scariest part about becoming a pastor was preaching. It feels like an enormous responsibility to speak God's word to God's people. There is the fear of making a mistake in interpreting God's message. We don't want to get it wrong. There's the fear of saying something that will make somebody angry, or even worse, is the fear that your message isn't reaching anyone at all. It's simply irrelevant. And then there are the little silly things like Maybe being afraid of getting the hiccups or losing your voice in the middle of a sermon. And now I've probably jinxed myself for sure. (laughs) But God, God calls all of us to something, whether we like it or not, whether we think we're worthy of being called or not. An answer to the concern that we are not worthy or good enough to satisfy God's call can, I believe, be found in our gospel reading for today, where Jesus meets with Nicodemus in secret to teach him about God's kingdom because Nicodemus was very curious about the message that Jesus brought. Recall that Nico, that's my my, uh, nickname for him, is a Pharisee, a Jewish leader, who had questions about the signs or the miracles that Jesus had worked in Jerusalem. Jesus talks to Nico for a while about being born again by water and the Spirit, which I think is code for baptism. We never hear whether Nico is baptized or not, but we do know that he came to believe that Jesus was the Savior and that after the crucifixion, Nicodemus even purchased the expensive spices that were used to embalm Jesus' body. It was in Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus that he uttered what was to become one of the most beloved passages in the Bible, if not the most loved words. And I think most of us know this by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. In this verse, Jesus assures us of his love for all who believe. 
Our salvation doesn't depend on our worth or whether we're good enough, but rather our belief in a love so strong that God sent his son to die for us. This takes our worthiness off the table and puts it all on Jesus, who will equip us for what we are called to do. So remember my aunt, the one who felt unworthy of God's love? Well, she was helped by medication and by visits from her family and her pastor. In time, her dark spells became fewer and fewer. And I believe that when she died a few weeks ago, she did so with peace in her soul, ready to see Jesus. Her funeral two weeks ago at her small Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Church in the countryside was packed to the rafters with family and friends and farmers all praying and singing songs of praise to God for the blessing of this woman of faith in our lives for almost 99 years. So, my questions for you to ponder in the days to come are, first, what do you feel that God is calling you to do at this age and stage of your life? And when you feel ready to think and talk more about your call, I want you to let me know, because I want to know how I, as your pastor, can help equip you for whatever it is that you feel called to do. Now, I'm not suggesting that you drop everything and, you know, go to seminary and become a pastor, although that would be lovely. But I can tell you (laughs) that it's not easy. And most of what God asks us to do is not a simple matter. But I do want to reflect on a conversation that I had with one of our members this past week who was excited about taking communion out to our homebound members and friends so that we could stay connected to them and so that we could bring bring God's sacrament to them in a team of three people. And I want to suggest that we could have multiple teams of people who do this. And I can tell you that it is just as much of a gift for those who take the sacrament out as it is to those who receive it. That's one simple way that one of our folks here at Emmanuel came up with to be able to be God's servant, to answer God's call to minister to others. There are many more, and I hope that we will take some time this summer to talk more about where you specifically feel that you are called to be God's hands and God's feet. So remember those two questions. What do you feel that God is calling you to do at this age and stage of your life? And how can I, as your pastor, help to equip you for whatever it is, no matter how large or how small uh, that task that you feel called to might be? So, are we ready to stand with Isaiah and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. In Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our service by standing as you are able to sing our song of the day, Baptized in Water, number 456. We join together in expressing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy, Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, under Pontius Pilate, buried, ascended into, on the day the ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With reverence for the earth, those in need, and the whole human family, let us offer our prayers to God. Deepen the worship life of the church and send us with fervent joy to testify to what we have seen and heard in our holy assemblies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Raise up leaders in this and every land who will speak out on behalf of those who are poor and oppressed. Let us pray to the Lord. Awaken in us a profound commitment to care for the earth that your glory may be revealed in lakes and rivers, mountains and valleys, plants and animals. Let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, O oh God. Teach us to call you Abba as we entrust to you all who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, O oh God. Pour out your blessings on all those celebrating graduations, marriages, and other transitions during this season. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Amen. We give thanks for all your holy ones baptized into the name of your holy trinity. May all born anew in the waters of grace eagerly respond to your call to serve. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Receive our hopes and prayers, O God of mercy, for great is your faithfulness in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer a sign of peace to those around us in a safe way. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, Redeemer and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. A 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power, glory, ever and ever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace and in God's peace. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that at this holy table, You again, with bread and wine, the food of everlasting life, send us, your servants, into the the land that we may act wisely, seek the good of our neighbor, and call others to come to the feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. We close with our sending song, Holy, 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 number 413.